so the title of the talk uh, today uh, is Structured Stories, the Computation of Journalistic Context. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dana Boyd, Robin Kaplan, Esther Tichai uh, uh, for inviting me out to come talk to all of you today. Um, I will tell you, this is those of you who in academia know that it's rare that you ever say something totally, completely, 100% new that you've never said before. Uh, this is new. This is totally new. I have not said a word of this before to anyone. Uh, so for better or worse, that's what we got. Um, and I think that uh, the talk will be much better by the end. Uh, so thank you all for uh, kind of bearing with me as I flesh you know, as I flesh these ideas out, because um, it really is a work in progress uh, at this point. Um, OK, so structured journalism. Um, I want to ask four, answer four questions today. What is it? Why does it matter? How does it work in terms of daily journalistic practice, at least in one very particular, sort of very odd but very interesting experiment that happened in New York this summer? And uh, what issues does it raise? What uh, problems does it cause? What sort of larger intellectual questions does it force us to ask um, about how journalism and how knowledge are produced in the 21st century? Um, you know, there's a difficulty with this subject right off the bat. And the difficulty with the subject is that perhaps less to a few people in this room, but to many people, this subject is totally and entirely new. Um, and it's also kind of odd. Um, and it often takes a great deal of time and sort of ramp up to explain um, what it even is uh, and why it might be interesting. Because it's so new, it's, it often takes a little time to sort of you know, get through to people, okay, this is what this is, this is what I'm talking about. Um, and, and when you spend a lot of time kind of ramping up to it, that forces you sometimes to leave behind some of the real interesting ethnographic details, right? So you, you spend a lot of time kind of saying, this is what this is, this is why this is interesting, this is why I think this is important, and a lot of the granular, uh, you know, sort of the granular texture of the creation of structured uh, journalism sometimes has to fall by the wayside. Um, so I'm really uh, gonna try to just jump right in and, you know, and, and tell you guys what this stuff is, and then that will get us into the sort of thicker empirical details uh, about halfway through the talk. Um, and I'm also gonna try to combine some of what I think the most interesting conclusions uh, of the research are with some questions for all of you. So I'm hoping that, you know, we can have a nice, vibrant, robust discussion, um, you know, for the last 20 minutes uh, or more uh, to really just have a larger conversation about these issues, especially, you know, I saw that there were people in the audience who are doing machine intelligence, algorithmic learning, different writing styles. Uh, I know Quartz, uh, for instance, has really experimented with a lot of this stuff in their own daily practice. So I'm really hoping that this can become, you know, at the end, a talk where I will learn from you as much as all of you learn uh, from me. Okay, so. We have been through, I would say, really in the last decade, although if you're a historian of data journalism, you can push the narrative of, of, of when something called data journalism came into being, at least back 40 years, uh, to the work of a scholar at UNC named Phil Meyer, uh, who pioneered something in the 1960s he called precision journalism. Um, but really, data journalism can go back uh, hundreds, uh, you know, at least a century and probably hundreds of years, right? So we have been living through um, at least a decade, if not more, of, of amazing, brilliant work being done in the world of data journalism, right? And I just have a screen cap here of the upshot, right? The upshot was introduced at the New York Times two years ago as a replacement for Nate Silver in 538, right? That was how it was sort of uh, actually discussed, right? Nate has gone off to ESPN and you know, is gonna get to be on television and is getting a lot of money uh, by being on ESPN. And you know, but the New York Times see, saw the work that he did and said, this was really important, right? And we know it's important and we want to replicate it in-house, right? And that, among many other things, uh, led to the creation of the upshot. Um, the upshot is only one example of this larger world of 
data journalism. And you can even see, you know, I, I picked this uh, cap from today, uh, just because I think the the you know the stories down at the bottom really kind of tell you what the upshot is all about, right? First story: the headlines have changed for Sanders, but the prediction markets haven't, right? Okay, so somehow this story is interfacing with prediction markets, right? Which are a larger way that people basically bet on who is going to be the president of the United States and, and many other things, right? So right off the bat, right, this is not the kind of story you would have seen in a newspaper um, even five years ago, right, or done by a news organization. Second, Bernie Sanders' win in Michigan changes the, rate, the race, but not the probabilities, right? Okay, probabilities, right? Probability, very upfront, center, right? That's a word that you wouldn't necessarily read in your average story about politics, um, even today, but certainly not, you know, um, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and then, you know, after dominating Super Tuesday, can Trump and Clinton be stopped? You know, an interactive delegate calculator that lets you simulate how the 2016 Republican and Democratic nominations might unfold, right? You can see the visualization there. Has anyone here used this calculator, by the way? Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. I mean, you know, and it's a great example of this past decade of data journalism, right? Drawing on data sets and applying creative visualizations that let you understand the narrative of news in new ways. Okay, now, what's interesting about this uh, is that this is not structured journalism. Structured journalism in some ways has absolutely nothing to do with what I've just been talking to you about for the last five minutes. But it's important that you understand this so you can know how it's different. Because a lot of times people think algorithms, data, computers, computational journalism, what's the role of algorithms in, in creating news, right? Robot news, newsroom analytics, right? This tends to kind of get lumped together both in common conversation and also still in scholarly practice. So I find it very useful to walk you through data journalism before I get to structured or computational journalism. Because I think that this will help you, when I get to computational journalism, this will help you understand what it is about this that's really different and what it is about it that's really new. What then is structured journalism? We can turn to the comments of Reg Chua in 2010, uh, a former um, uh, reporter and editor with Reuters, uh, who uh, is an affiliate uh, at the Columbia Journalism School periodically. Um, this is really the first formal articulated definition of what structured journalism actually is. He was probably, I think, the first person to define it in this particular way. And his definition of structured journalism is as follows. The gist of structured journalism is to change the way we create content so as to, number one, maximize its shelf life, as well as, and this is really the important thing, as well as, as structuring as much as possible the information in stories at the time of creation for use in databases that can form the basis of news, news stories or information products, okay? So, the way it changes the way we create content, number one, we're gonna maximize shelf life, right? Number two, we're going to structure as much as possible the information we read in news stories when we make them in order that they can be used in databases and that they can then later on form the basis of news stories or information products. That is, I think, a very, very good definition of what structured journalism is. Um, and now I'm going to explicitly compare it to data journalism, right? And I think this is a great way of thinking about this difference. Data journalism. This stuff, right? Draws on data sets, right? One of the dominant trends of our era, you know, data and society, here we are, um, is the explosion of the amount of accessible, available, computational data that is out there generated by ordinary people, government agencies, um, you name it, right? 
massive explosion in the amount of accessible data that is being produced in society. Right? And so what data journalism does is data journalism draws on all of those data sets to create a narrative. Right? We've got data out there. What are we going to do? We're going to draw on that data to create a narrative news story. Right? Prediction markets, some sort of data, right? We're going to use the behavior of those prediction markets to tell a story about Bernie Sanders. Right? That is what data journalism fundamentally does. It uses data to tell stories. OK. Structured journalism flips that on its head. Right? What structured journalism does in the most simple form is it takes narratives and out of those narratives, turns them into structured data. You've got a story, right? Um, and out of that story, you are going to create, you're going to pull the information out and structure it in a particular way that allows it to basically live in a database, right? Data journalism, you go databases to story. Structured journalism, you go story to database. That is what, in a very, very simplified fashion, that is the idea of structured journalism. Um, and the folks I studied this summer like to tell a story about how you get structured information out of a narrative. Uh, and they tell a little Red Riding Hood story. Has anyone heard this example before in the world of sort of the semantic web or anything like that, right? Fairy tales are a perfect example of how you get structure out of a story. And in fact, structural linguistic uh, linguists have been talking about this for over a century. And this is where we'll talk about this later. But a lot of the ideas of structured journalism come from people like Saussure and people operating in the world of, of linguistics. Right? Little Red Riding Hood. You have Little Red Riding Hood, the protagonist. Right? You have uh, the location she operates in, which is the forest, right? You have an object, right, which is the basket that she's carrying as she, you know, walks along the forest road. You have her destination, which is her grandmother, and you have an obstacle which meets her at the end, right, which is the wolf, who then eats her, right? Hunter comes along later, too. Jack of the Beanstalk, right? Jack of the Beanstalk, protagonist, operates in an environment, right, the beanstalk, which he then climbs, gets up the beanstalk. Antagonist is there, right? The giant, right? Messes around with the giant in some, I don't remember actually what happens. I think he, he you know, sort of torments the giant in some fashion and then steals his goose, which is the object that he takes and then runs down the beanstalk with, right? Now, those are not the same story, but you can see how fairy tales are a particularly good example of how every narrative, at least according to people who really, um, emphasize this idea of structured journalism. Um, fairy tales are a great classic example, right? Because they're simple stories that have existed, some people now say, for, for millennia, right? Some people have recently written about how fairy tales can go back to the Bronze Age, right? And it's very easy to see how structure, informational structure operates in fairy tales. Now, what does this all have to do with journalism? Does structured journalism exist beyond people talking about how it relates to fairy tales. Uh, yes, it does. Two examples of structured journalism um, that I want to briefly mention to you right now. Uh, the first is something called Homicide Watch. Who here has heard of Homicide Watch? OK, yeah, about half of you. Um, the idea behind Homicide Watch um, it started in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., it has since closed. It, I, it has closed down, I'm pretty sure, although it's sort of always back and forth with Homicide Watch about whether they're ever truly permanently closed in D.C. But Homicide Watch in D.C., right? The idea of Homicide Watch is that rather than focusing on a few sensational murders in Washington, D.C., right, and writing a traditional five-paragraph news story about a random murder here and there, right, that for whatever reason was horrific enough or brutal enough that it merited being considered journalistically newsworthy, right? That's how murder often gets covered in urban centers, right? It's got to be so off the charts and so unusual that a journalist is going to take the time to write about it, right? Most murder in cities isn't that way. 
right? Much of it, you know, uh, is far more routine. Um, obviously not for the people involved, but, you know, it is, it is not, uh, you know, it doesn't ascend that scale of horror that usually is required for it to make it into the daily newspaper. So the founders of Homicide Watch thought this was both a travesty for the victims of these crimes and also gave a poor understanding to Americans of how gun violence and how killings in cities actually takes place. And so what they said was, they are going to create, out of these police reports of killings, they are going to create a database that can then be populated by all of the structured data that is embedded in every story of a killing in a city. Right? In the same way that data was embedded in the fairy tale narratives that I told you earlier, right? Who was killed? Where? Why? By who? With what weapon? Right? And out of that, those narratives or those police reports, they are going to build a database of structured information. And that was Homicide Watch. Mark every death, remember every victim, follow every case. That was the idea that underlied, underlay Homicide Watch in Washington, DC, and that underlies it still uh, in Trenton. Um, one example of structured journalism. Second example, who here has ever heard of PolitiFact? Most people. Okay. PolitiFact is not often discussed as structured journalism, um, but there's an interesting reason why I'm talking about it as structured journalism in this talk, uh, and that has to do with Bill Adair, who's the gentleman who founded it, um, who is a player in our story in just another minute or two. Um, and in fact, my colleague Lucas Graves, uh, who's an assistant professor at University of Wisconsin, and I are working on a project right now where I'm sort of talking about the stuff I'm talking about with you guys today. Lucas has done research on PolitiFact, uh, and he and I together are working on a paper um, which is going to sort of take a larger look at structured journalism, both uh, as it relates to PolitiFact and as it relates to the case I'm going to talk to all of you about today. So PolitiFact, why is PolitiFact considered why might we consider it structured journalism, right? Okay, Hillary Clinton said, the clean power plan is something that Senator Sanders had said he would delay implementing. And they then give those political statements a rating. And she did pretty bad on this particular statement. It's false, it's not pants on fire, which is their worst rating, uh, but it's pretty bad, right? Uh, Bernie Sanders said, if you look at Latino kids between seven and 20 who graduated high school, 36% of them are unemployed, right? And that rates a mostly true on the PolitiFact meter, right? Okay, this is all about a database. This is all about structured data. How? What do we have here? Politician, statement, rating. Structured data, pure and simple, right? Politician statement rating. Hillary Clinton makes a thousand statements over the course of a campaign in a particular location, in reference to a particular subject, and they get a particular rating, right? You build a database out of this information, what can you do? Well, you can sort it to see, does Hillary Clinton get false statements every time she talks about Bernie Sanders, and only Bernie Sanders, right? Does she tend to get more true statements when she talks about other topics, right? This is the database underlying PolitiFact, right? That is created out of semantic utterances said, you know, of politicians. You wouldn't know that PolitiFact is a database if you went to the website. You don't go there and think to yourself like, oh my gosh, this is how boring. This is a database, right? They have these great little graphs and they have pants on fire and they do a lot more than this on PolitiFact. But one of the key things underlying PolitiFact is the fact that it is fundamentally operating as a database, a database of linguistic utterances that get a truthfulness rating. That's what PolitiFact is. Okay, these are examples of structured journalism. Okay, why does it matter? Why, what, so who cares about all this, right? You got some weird journalists off there building databases out of things people say. Why should we care about any of this? Um, I think we should care about it for three reasons. I think we should care about it because it complicates, if not entirely uh, changes, journalistic notions of what objectivity is. 
this deeply is deeply implicated in journalists' own self-understanding of what they mean to say that something is objective. Um, there is a news business model reason why we ought to care about structured journalism. Um, some leading structured journalism theorists argue that by bundling the news in different ways, um, new business models can be constructed out of those bundles. Right? I'm going to talk about that in conclusion, but some of the leading proponents of structured journalism argue that this is actually a better business model for news than the average narrative story. I don't know if that's true, but they're making that argument. So there are business, reason, uh, business model reasons why um, it might matter. Uh, third, uh, there are public reasons, right? Uh, that are in part related to this regrounding of objectivity, right? So if journalists understand objectivity in a different way, and if their work practices embody objectivity in a different way, then do they offer, do they act as a check on the powerful in new or different ways, right? Journalism's mission has always been deeply tied up in their argument that they provide an objective, objective analysis of what the powerful are saying. If I'm right, and this really does change journalistic understanding of objectivity in some particular way, then is there a further consequence that the public check that journalists provide on the powerful is also rethought? Or is it not rethought at all, which is also interesting, uh, in a totally different way, right? So if you have these structural changes, but journalists don't really think about their relationship with centers of power differently at all, what does that say about journalism, right? I mean, it's. It's one of those neat academic things where it's interesting no matter what the empirical reality is, <laughs> which, which we get good at. Um, you know, and I mean, another example, right? You can look at, I mean, Homicide Watch, does reporting urban crime in this way change what journalism is? Does it actually change our understanding of what urban crime is, right? If so, how? If not, why not? Right, I mean, I think that's, you know, again, that's in, in all seriousness, that's an interesting question, whatever the answer is. Okay, so what did I, what did I do this summer? Um, I want to talk about uh, some field work that I did on a project called Structured Stories. Um, most of what you're gonna see from this point on in terms of pictures are pictures taken by me while I was doing ethnographic research at uh, the Structured Stories offices, um, which were downtown. Um, I have uh, eliminated, some of the best pictures were pictures of the three students from Duke University who are actually working uh, on the project, but because of confidentiality conversations I had with them and because one of them was, 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 was 18, uh, I'm not obviously showing any of those, so they will remain nameless um, and unpictured. Um, but the project was primarily run and maintained by three uh, Duke students um, who I will get to in a minute, but this is a typical example of uh, the information I gathered when I was doing research at Structured Stories, right? So this is a part of a training uh, presentation that all of the Duke students got when they first began the project, right? And this is, you know, this is the argument, right? Narrative structures might usefully replace or supplement text articles. This is the argument that the founders of Structured Stories were making to the students who were going to be doing the work, which is basically one of the arguments I just recapitulated for all of you, right? Blah, 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 blah. That's the typical news story, right? Broken down into all these chaotic blah, blah, blahs. Oh, look, here at the end, very nicely structured, right? The blah, blah, blahs become structured. Blah, blah, blahs, right? This is, you know, in, a, in, in terms of, you know, the details I was seeing, this is very typical of, of all the training I saw that these um, students were getting when they first started this project. Um, so this uh, research was ethnographic field work. Um, I am not, it's always tricky uh, in mixed audiences where you have some students, some academics, some working professionals, right? Because the working professionals uh, or you know, the students often couldn't really care at all about the very nitty gritty details of your methodology. The doctoral students in the room want to do nothing else uh, but talk to me <laughs> about my methodology, which is fine. Uh, I'm gonna just, you know, very, very quickly, this, this is what it was. Um, 
I'm happy to talk about it further in the Q&A. Um, I think the most important thing I want to tell all of you uh, or get, get across to you about this research um, is that it is not research at a level that would pass muster alone to get into a peer-reviewed journal article. That is important to know. If I took everything I'm telling you today and tried to get it published in a, published in a traditional academic peer-reviewed journal article, it probably would not get in, and I wouldn't submit it for that reason. It's three months, it's one project, it's one very idiosyncratic project, it's hard to see how its findings can be generalizable in any way, even you know, in terms of qualitative research, right? Um, so that's the main thing for the scholars in the room, that's the main thing to know about this. Um, that's why I'm working with Professor Graves to sort of join forces and maybe, you know, see if we can, you know, expand the lens of this out a little bit. Um, and this will also be the final chapter of a book under contract with Oxford University Press called Journalistic Cultures of Truth. Journalistic Cultures of Truth is a historical book that starts with the progressive era and structured journalism, this information right now, is the last chapter. It's the end. The great thing about books is that they don't need to be, uh, in terms of their individual chapters, quite at the level of uh, you know, uh, peer-reviewed uh, journal articles, which also makes them more interesting, to be honest. Um, but, so, you know, we can talk about the methods more if you want, but that's kind of the more interesting view of methods, right? It's good, it's interesting, I learned a lot from it, I think this points us in a lot of interesting directions, but, you know, it's not, uh, you know, not solid enough that, that it would pass muster with reviewer two. Okay, so here is what, here's what, this is structured stories. <laughs> the idea of structured stories was this. Two, uh, two folks, Bill Adair, who was working with PolitiFact, who I mentioned already, uh, and a gentleman named David Caswell, decided they wanted to do an experiment about whether they could do structured, they could, generate structured information out of daily beat reporting on city government, right? We saw structure in Homicide Watch, right? That is a specific thing, urban crime. We saw structure emerging out of PolitiFact. That is a specific thing, right? Fact-checking politicians. David was really interested, and Bill Adair was interested as well, right? Can you, can you structure everything, <laughs> right? Bill de Blasio gives a press conference about some you know, piece of urban um, you know, a bill that's being you know, passed. Can you structure that in a way that's interesting, you know, journalistically valid, right? Can you apply structure more or less to everything that would happen in terms of daily news reporting, right? So take it out of its specific um, you know, uh, silos and, and just structure everywhere, right? That was the basic experiment. Um, that was powering structured journalism. Uh, Bill and David, you know, put it together, and they hired three Duke journal. Uh, one was a journalism student, one was a government uh, student, um, and the other was an international affairs student. Uh, they hired those students um, to, you know, come in and and run the project, and it was great for them because they got to hang out in NYU dorms in New York for a summer, and also kind of test out these ideas to see if they worked. Okay, this um, this is the fundamental underlying idea behind structured stories. There's an event, okay? There is an event that happens in the world. Identify the event. Identify the central verb of the event. Propose a frame net frame. What the heck is that? I'm gonna talk about that in one second. Identify the location of the event, the time of the event, the participants, right? I mean, you can see this. I'm not going to go through it, right? But you can see, given the information I've given you already about structure and narrative, you can see how this all works, right? Take events and break them down in all of these particular ways, right? And input that into a database. For me, in some ways, the most interesting and important part of this whole process was this part right here. Propose a frame net frame. Has anyone here heard of frame net? I thought it might be you guys over there, but if you guys haven't heard of it, then no one has heard of it. Um, this is FrameNet. FrameNet was created by uh, linguistic scholars and uh, you know, machine learning uh, faculty at the University of California, Berkeley. 
this is open to the public. You can, you can, it's part of a National Science Foundation grant. You can log on right now, right? FrameNet attempted to basically build a, a semantic lexicon of verbs that would cover everything and also cover it in specific ways that would allow it to be um, machine readable. Right, so you can see an example here, right? Provide lodging, that's a verb, right? And a host provides a temporary residence for a lodger, right? And you can see host is in red, that's the person. Provided what? Provided a residence for who? For a lodger, right? And all of these verb cases operate in this way, right? And you can see it gets into even more detail down here, right? This is the verb frame, and the idea was, okay, Bill de Blasio gives a press conference. What is give a press conference here? We have to figure out what give a press conference is, and then as part of this semantic database we are building about events in New York, we are going to link every single verb back to this semantic database that these guys at University of California, Berkeley, uh, have put together. That um, is the basic idea behind structured journalism. Um, what was the daily work like? Um, like I said, there are a lot more great uh, pictures uh, of this that I can't show because it involves people's faces. Um, but, okay, right here, right? Can anyone see what she's got in her hand right here? Can anyone tell what that is? Highlighter, right? Yeah, it's a highlighter, right? Okay, and, and you can see there's a pink highlighter and there's a blue highlighter and a green highlighter and there's an orange highlighter that she's used already, right? These are her notes from a press conference. She went out to a press conference, has a notebook, right? This is my notebook from the press conference. What she's doing now, uh, this is simplifying it a bit, but what she's doing now is she's basically doing this to her notes. Right? So she's got her notebook and she's in there with a the highlighter and it's kind of like, all right, this is an object, I'm going to highlight it in blue. This is a verbal action, I'm going to highlight it in green. This is the um, recipient of that action, I'm going to highlight it in red. Right? This is one of the things that these journalists were doing an awful lot as they were working on this structured stories project. Then they were taking this and putting it into the structured stories back end, which was the database. Right? back end that David had created, and they were inputting all of these events into the database. Now, how do they decide what to focus on? Because it was an experiment, they decided they were gonna focus on different threads over the course of the summer. They wanted to focus on public housing, they wanted to focus on Uber, Right? How it was, if you remember, this was the exact time of that council bill that ended up getting, um, you know, put aside when, when it looked, you know, Bill de Blasio wanted to, to cap the number of Uber cars in New York. Uh, so this was going on at the time. Um, they ended up doing a, um, a police, uh, police shootings and uh, police brutality was a third thread, right? And so they were going to focus on these different threads, right? So not, not really everything, but they were gonna focus on these threads, right? So these were, so the project was structured stories. Within that structured stories, uh, larger umbrella, they focused each uh, person from Duke focused on a different thread, right? One focused on Uber, one focused on public housing, one focused on police uh, community interactions, right? Out of those threads, they then created stories, right? And what were stories? All stories were, were networked events. That's what the stories were. The stories were this giant back-end database of networked events. That's what they were doing. Um, out of that, they created a network database of summer events in New York City clustered around a few central themes. Right? That is what they produced. Uh, there's a ton more of information here that I don't have time to tell you, right? Um, if you're interested, I can tell you about uh, how the Duke students reacted to this. 
right? So you're a young, imagine all of you from Georgetown, right? Or if you've ever been a journalist, right? You, you, you know, you go to a summer project and the person says, okay, little journalist, here's what you're gonna do. This is your work for the summer. How did they react to this? Interesting question. Um, I'm happy to tell you about it uh, in the Q&A. Um, all sorts of like human kind of reactions to, to, to this. Um, was this a success or a failure? Um, no one's really sure yet, right? Uh, they're still trying to figure it out. What did this look like on the front end? Uh, it looked poor, right? It didn't look very good. It looked like a database, right? There was a huge amount of fighting that went on about um, whether they were gonna make the database look pretty and if so, when they were going to do that. Does user interface matter with this? And if so, when, right? Um, but rather than talking about all that, which I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A, I wanna leave you with some final issues and questions, right? And this ties back to what I said earlier about the reasons why I think this matters. Number one, what does it mean to ground objectivity in a semantic database? To some degree, these journalists saw what they were doing as objective in a new way, and it was objective because it tied back into this. Right? This is objective. If you can relate it in a very mechanical way back to what's going on in this database, this is sort of second order objectivity, right? This is a form of objectivity that is grounded in a database rather than the world. To me, that's sort of heavy duty stuff. Um, question one. Question two. Um, this relates to a lot of other research I've done before, but you know, should journalists bother going outside to cover stories, right? If your main task is kind of turning narrative into structured information in this way, are you really just an aggregator, <laughs> to use a dirty word, right? Why bother going to the press conference? What does going to a press conference get you uh, that you couldn't get, maybe your time would be better spent, um, you know, um, just going through stories that have already been written uh, and turning them into structured information. That's question two. Uh, question three, uh, <laughs> is this rewarding work, right? Is this type of work rewarding for the people who are doing it? If not, are there ways to make it more rewarding? When this stops being an experiment and starts being a job, are there ways to make this more rewarding? Four, what's the business model? I promised you there was a business model. Uh, again, happy to answer questions about that. Uh, in the Q&A, because there, there is one, but what's the business model? How does the business model behind this idea get articulated? Uh, and finally, you know, I said this before, what kind of public accountability stems from creating structured information? Can journalists generate public accountability in new ways when they are operating as the creators of structured public information or not, right? And if so, how? Um, that is it. Um, I will leave it there, and I am happy to, uh, I've sort of planted some questions in your minds. I'm sure you <laughs> have tons of others. Uh, the other question you might find interesting to ask is, do I like this? Uh, I haven't really tipped my hand on that yet. But anyway, this is it. Thank you all for coming, and I'm happy to just, we can talk now. Great, so I'd love to open this up to questions. I have a few of my own too, but I will ask them when things slow down. Hi, thank you. That was a really insightful um, talk you just gave. A couple, two, two separate questions. One, um, how, do you, um, how do you make this transparent? So we are talking about putting it into a database. There's obviously like a kind of bottom limit to what is possible to put into a database. And I'm imagining if this is an open rule set, people are capable of like, you know, like gaming it to say things which feed into a database factually when it actually could be suggested. How do you hack it? I guess is one question. And two is who's actually collecting it, right? Because then just thinking about the fact that if there's an easy database available that is giving you facts, then no one, and everyone trusts those, that database as facts, how do we account for that? Yeah kind of yeah. thing. Uh, fantastic question. There are two different ways. Uh, so, you know, the question was, um, where's the bottom, you know, where's the bottom limit for this database and how do you, you know, it's being presented as facts, right? I mean, how, how do you know, right? Can this be gamed in certain ways, right? What are the larger biases that are sort of affecting the construction of this database? And there are two answers. One answer is that 
is the ethnographic answer, right? From the mouths of my subjects, from the mouths of the people I was studying, um, bias is overcome through size. <laughs> so when the database is big enough and it is computationally manageable, bias goes away. Right? If you make the database big enough, bias disappears in sort of large, you know, they didn't use this words, but large networkness, right? Computational size, you know, filters out possible biases that may creep into the, into the database. Um, that's, the, that's the ethnographic answer. Uh, the other answer I would give is that this deeply ties into um, work in STS, in particular sort of feminist critiques of databases. Uh, there's a lot of structure out there, uh, there's a lot of scholarship out there that basically comes from a feminist perspective, feminist science and technology studies that studies the way that biases are inevitably and inherently encoded in databases, right? Uh, Heather Ford um, at the University of Leeds is doing some great work on this and sort of the Wikipedia knowledge graph, right? The Wikipedia knowledge graph has all sorts of things going on inside that knowledge graph. Um, that leave it open to slants, biases in a particular way, right? So to do this, you have to tie this research into that work that's already being done, I think, in feminist STS, in particular, on bias in databases, right? But it should also, it's important to sort of finish by saying that um, while the journalists I was, if I told this to the journalists that I was working with, they would probably say, that is totally right. They would not disagree with what I was saying. These are very smart, sensitive people. But that wouldn't necessarily inf you know, affect the work they were doing, <laughs> right? So on some level, that larger academic critique doesn't matter to the people actually doing the day-to-day -day work, uh, except maybe much more long-term. I'm actually going to use moderator privilege. Yeah. Um, so I have a, I'm wondering more about yeah, what these journalists thought they were doing. Obviously, algorithms are being used more and more to automate the news. This feels very much like a training data type of situation. Um, I can assume that they'd feel probably a little resentful that their jobs were being, they were even helping to like kind of automate out jobs. But on the other side, gives a validity that's kind of, you know, being appealed to within our culture at large about yeah. like, yeah, the importance of computational practices um, in humanistic work. Yeah. So, yeah, I want you to, I would love to know a little bit more about how they felt about yeah. doing this work. Yeah, um, that is a, that is sort of in, in some ways the most, the, the key question, right? Um, the title of this, uh, I'm presenting this at ICA uh, in Japan this summer as a full paper. The title of the paper is called Our Audience is a Machine, which is a direct quote from one of the people who was working in this, right? They said their audience, the audience for this information are not human beings, but machines. And when I was talking about this paper with a colleague at USC Annenberg, uh, she said, um, maybe you should call it, you know, our workers are a machine. <laughs> Right? Like, isn't this just sort of training journalists to kind of be mechanical Turks or, you know, something, something like that? Um, and that was dealt with in a very interesting way on the ground. Um, in addition to all of this, the journalists would, would do all this work, and then they would write stories. But they would do this first, and then the stories would come next. Right? And so there was a point in one of the training sessions where, you know, I had kind of, the journalists had kind of gotten the walkthrough that I just gave you, and they were kind of all like freaking out, you know what I mean? They were sort of like, this isn't what we thought we were going to be doing, is this, I can't believe I'm going to be doing this all summer, uh, is this really, um, you know, is this really, uh, you know, what I should be doing as a journalist, right? They didn't quite encounter the, the automation side of it, I don't think, but, but they were at least having some, some dilemmas on that level. And what one of the people who was running the project then said was, oh, but don't worry, this is just the first step. You're going to write stories later and people are going to read them. And that was sort of like, oh, okay, phew, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like not problem solved, um, but in the paper uh, that's coming out of this, I have, um, something called um, anxiety off-ramps, 
right? And over the course of the experiment, uh, there were several anxiety off-ramps provided for journalists, right? Where as soon as they felt anxious, there was kind of an off-ramp that would um, calm them. Um, and the idea that, oh, hey, okay, after this, we're still gonna write like real stories, that was one of those anxiety off-ramps, right? So, and this is important because no one in this was saying, you're never gonna write stories again. What they were saying was, you're not gonna write stories first. Right, and uh, whether that anxiety off-ramp uh, should be seen as a legitimate answer to the larger questions you raise, right? Like, oh, they're right, problem solved, they can still write these stories. Or whether we would approach it from a more critical way, right? This is sort of, you know, I hate the word false consciousness, right? But this is some sort of, you know, like, bone that's being thrown to kind of calm people down, I think is, I'm not ready to answer that yet. You know, I, I, I'm not sure. But, you know, I think you could certainly see it both ways. So, yeah, does that, does that kind of, yeah, lots of anxiety off-ramps provided for the, the people doing this work. Super interesting. Have you uh, looked into how structured journalism applies to sports reporting, sports journalism? Yeah, I, I, I have not specifically. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, uh, sports reporting is the fundamental, I mean, if you, who here is, well, baseball box score, right? I mean, baseball box score is, if you wanted to talk about the essence of structured, you know, turning events into structure, it's a baseball box score, right? A baseball box score is, you know, that big, and somehow you can read the entire game in the data, right? Um, so, you know, probably this is happening, uh, a lot in sports reporting already, and to some degree has always happened in sports reporting um, because it's so statistically uh, involved. And in fact, uh, real quick, um, a friend and a colleague of mine named Jackie Marr, who now works for the BBC, um, used to work for the New York Times. And when she worked for the New York Times, her, I'm not gonna, gonna tell the whole story, but one of her first assignments was the Olympics in London to act as a, a uh, computational journalist who was interfacing with the London Olympics. And Jackie tells this great story about how it was her job to take uh, the, the uh, feed coming from the Olympics governing body, right, which was every stat and every result of every event and somehow turn that into structured data. So you can imagine, like, there are hundreds of Olympic events every single one with completely different rules, right? So, you know, weightlifting. There are different ways you foul out of weightlifting that are different than the ways you foul out of another sport, right? There are different ways you're disqualified. Coming in second means something different in weightlifting than it might in another event, right? So, yeah, sports is kind of ground zero um, for, for a lot of work already being done and also some really deep intellectual work and then just real, uh, engineering problems that, that, you know, people doing the computational work on this are trying to solve, right? It was a massive intellectual task to try to figure out how the Times was going to structure the data coming from the 2012 Olympics. Oh, sorry, sorry I have the mic. So. <laughs> we'll pass it back there. Um, can you talk a little about, uh, a little more about how technology fits in? It seems like um, this could be a really useful tool, especially as you build a database for people who are out reporting. Um, maybe there's keywords that you can right. pick, like you don't have to write down everybody's name, you can just select them or pre-populate or something. I was a little surprised to see that everybody hand wrote. I don't know if they chose to hand write right. and then highlight or yeah. if they could bring a tablet and input right. things. You know, so it, that's a great question, and in some ways, you're, you're pointing to a really interesting aspect of this, which is that, to some degree, technology plays a pretty small role. Um, it, it's le this work, even more so than like data journalism, which is kind of the contrast I started out with, this work is really about computational thinking rather than computers. Right, this is about thinking like a computer than having a computer that you use. Um, so technology was not really involved in the data gathering end. Um, technology was not really involved in the data storage end, although you know, you'd, 
you did have to kind of create the structure that the semantic information would live inside. Um, computational thinking, though, came into play when you had to decide um, what kind of a, an event is a press conference. And are we going to encode it in this frame or in this frame? <laughs> I mean, that's not technology at all, right? But that's, that's training yourself to think like a particular type of technological worker and a type of technological artifact, right? Um, yeah, but it was very old fashioned. Notebooks, um, laptops, um, you know, iPhones, right? It's sort of the standard. There was nothing in here that would go outside, you know, kind of the standard data gathering tools of, of traditional journalism. Um, the new tools were in the data, the, the data storage. Um, and the sort of, I guess I should say, that one of the end goals of this uh, is for the, one of the founders of the project to come up with a list of the 600 most common event frames in reporting urban news. So like a, a code book almost of like, here are the 600 most common events that happen in a city. And here are all the examples of them, right? So to automate it like to that degree. And so again, that's, um, I'm sure he's going to use programming language and algorithms and um, you know data processing tools to generate that list, but he's also just thinking about it. You know what I mean? He's also just so so in some ways technology is all at the very very back end, not at um, the data gathering end, uh, which again I think is interesting and different than you know than data journalism. Great talk and really interesting. I actually see a lot of promise for this type of journalism. And the reason why is a question that you posed um, sort of in the middle, which is what can you do with databases that you cannot do with narrative? And you didn't really mention it. You sort of just alluded to it just now with the word codebook. But it reminds me a lot of the content analysis we do with news, where you turn sentences into, you know, you apply a number of variables. And with that, you can see patterns, you can you know, make links that you would not be able to see otherwise if you were just looking at it sort of as a narrative. Yeah. And that is the reason I see a lot of promise is because if journalists can then say, okay, de Blasio is using you know, this sort of language when he's talking about schools and he's using this sort of language about housing and like, what is, how has he done that before? What, right, so all of those implications. And for those reasons, I think it's really, really exciting and really promising and um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, so just to quickly kind of riff off that a little bit. Um, a lot of, the, all the folks working on this project would agree with you. Um, all the people working in the structured journalism world would, would agree with you using a lot of the language that you just used. Um, I would agree with you, you know, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and would disagree with you on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and Sundays I wouldn't think about it, right? But, you know. It's really this, it gets to this fundamental question though of what is journalism for? Is journalism about uniques or is it about patterns, right? Is journalism about uncovering the unique, the one-off, the unusual, the sort of thick, you know, nature of what it means to do things or is it about, you know, structure, right? Right, is it, it doesn't structure? have to be one or the other. No. And the the other thing that I was going to say, which you just reminded me of, is this kind of sort of begs the interesting scholarly question, is journalism becoming more scholarly if it goes in this direction, right? Because it is very much about, right, seeing patterns, you know, sort of making things empirical, making things quantitative. Um, it definitely doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, and the good thing about journalism and the really, the tricky... <laughs> The tricky and cool thing about studying journalism is that th that is almost always the journalistic answer, right? When academics try to get too dogmatic about like, you know, are you a humanist or are you a social scientist? You know, we see the world as one or the other and you're one of these ideal types or you're the other thing. Journalists are kind of like, yeah, but you're kind of both. Like, chill, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, and journalists, I think, and this is the, the great thing and the hard thing and the, the scholarly productive thing about studying journalism is that journalists themselves push back against what I think many of us see as, as those really fascinating kind of theoretical questions, right? And, and journalists say, well, you can, you can do both. You don't have to be 
you know, one or the other, and that is always, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that response, but you to force your brain to overcome that argument, I think is a good intellectual exercise uh, for academics. Um, yeah, I have other thoughts on whether it's becoming more scholarly, um, but I'll, you know, we can talk about that later. I wanna give other folks a chance to. Yeah, um, question, like you said, uh, is objectivity um, possible through structural journalism? But I feel like in the world, there are many things are value judgment. It's not just what, when, how, and where. It's like, okay, how to describe, um, use like the adjectives. There are, it's, there are many creativity involved. So I think journalists should still go to the invent report to observe. It's not just like the essential elements of a, like a philosophical kind, you know. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, what is the business model that like, you think in your mind? <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'll do the business model question first since I sort of dangled that one in front of you and then didn't answer it. But then I have a really, I have an important thing to say about the other question too. Um, business model, right? Um, one of the ideas uh, expressed as to how this would work as a business model is that, let me see if I can get it right. Um, Facebook doesn't make money by building ads off individual posts on Facebook. Facebook makes money by drawing on its huge database of semantic behavior of its users, right? The value of Facebook is the stored, like the stored web of everyone who's using Facebook all the time, right? It's not like Facebook is selling ads off articles. That's simplifying a lot, but, but the value of Facebook is in everything, you know, the, the, you know, however much data underlies Facebook, that's where Facebook makes its money, right? So the argument was, what if by building this incredibly elaborate, incredibly rich, incredibly complex network of urban political events, we could sell that to advertisers? Right? So we're not going to, we will rebundle the news. Basically, the, the business model was rebundling the news, but we're not going to rebundle the news as a collection of individual articles or individual narratives that then get put together in a website or put together in a news product. We're going to rebundle the news out of, an, out of an incredibly elaborate networked series of semantic events. And that's what we're going to sell to advertisers. And I think the other dream was that just like there can only be one Facebook, uh, maybe there can only be one structured stories, right? Once you've got first mover advantage in there, it's really hard to duplicate what Facebook does. And so I think the other sort of business hope with this is that if you're the first, you're it, right? If you're the first one to have that networked web of urban events, it's very, very hard for anyone to take that lunch from you, basically, right? Um, objectivity, that was your other question. Um, I had a great answer to that. Um, right. So I have an argument which I'm not fully confident of making yet in a presentation like this, but I think is really important. I think that seeing objectivity in the way it is seen here as being grounded in a database in this way is, is valued by our society at this particular moment because we have lost faith in earlier kinds of objectivity. I think that the professional press has been so, the ability of the professional press to make value judgments in the way that you are putting it out there, right, has been so undermined and has been so attacked and has been so critiqued, right? So where did journalistic objectivity come from? Journalistic objectivity came from professional processes, right? It's not that the journalists themselves were objective, but out of the process would come objective information. That's Michael Shudson's basic argument in discovering the news. If our faith in the process to produce objective truth has been devastated in the 21st century, then maybe there is a third step that is taken to see objectivity in this way. Right? If objectivity can't be produced by individual journalists themselves, and if we've totally lost faith in the professional process, maybe we need to build these other semantic databases, and out of that will come objectivity. So I totally agree with you, and I think you're pointing to one potential aspect of the very real crisis in objectivity that is facing journalism and facing other knowledge professions in the digital age. 
And I think that this is one attempt to deal with that crisis. Michael disagrees with me. But Michael Shudson does not agree with this, I should say, but it's okay. Um, to what extent do you think that structured journalism could arise not as a result of journalists doing it, but just basically algorithmic analysis of ordinary news stories? Because it seems to me that's a, that's a much easier way at least to make it scale. S the algorithms have to get a little bit better, but, but nonetheless that feels like a, a likelier path for some of it to happen. And, and that's a fantastic question. And this is exactly what the founders of this project were arguing against. They were saying, look, one way to build structured journalism is to turn an algorithm loose on the narratives and have that semantic structured data extracted from already existing narratives. Right? Exactly what you said. That is one way to do this. Uh, and they were arguing, uh, you know, uh, for I think self interested, but also for real intellectually honest reasons, that this was better and easier. Yeah, that there was more of a likelihood, it, th rather than drawing the structured data out of the story once it was already done, this is, uh, this is have the structured data embedded from the beginning, right? Because the algorithms, I think, the argument would be that the algorithms are never gonna be good enough. And they're never gonna be capable of kind of dissecting these narrative stories in the way that, you know, you or other journalists might want. Yes, uh, I think, um, here's, here was the argument that I heard made. The argument is that um, w in a real organization that embraced this, uh, the last um, 20 minutes of every journalist's day would be this. Right, you've done your work for the day, right? You've done whatever else you're gonna do. Last 20 minutes, you do this. Right, you turn your notebook and you turn your notes and you turn your tape recordings and you turn everything else into structured data. And that's the last part of your day and then you go home. Right, and I think that's why so much emphasis in this experiment was placed on the training. Right, this was all about the training. I mean, this was all about teaching you to have this become so second nature that you can do it at the end of the day without much effort. Well, I don't want them to sac I mean, I don't care what they do. Um, you know, I think the argument, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I think that, you know, one, uh, one answer would be, you know, rather than, um, you know, blogging something, you know, the fifth time, you know, blog it four times uh, and then, you know, do this instead. Um, but your point is, I mean, that's a, that's a good point, right? It's not as if 20 minutes in a journalistic day is just, you know, that easy to find, right? Reporter schedules are packed already, especially in kind of this era of digital production, right? Um, but I think that, that that ultimately was what was offered as sort of the, you know, kind of responding to Gideon's point, right? Which is, this seems so labor intensive. The idea, I think, was that with enough training, it doesn't have to be labor intensive. And sacrificing 20 minutes is better than sacrificing what these young students were doing for most of the time I saw them, which was, you know, four or five hours, you know, trying to learn how to do this. Um, so, and this is fascinating, um, but when you were talking about the whole project, I couldn't care less about objectivity, mm -hmm. but I was really worried about narrative. Yeah. And especially now that you mentioned, like, the sort of the grand vision, if I may call that, um, is like spending every 20 minutes doing that kind of exercise. Like I couldn't help wonder like what kind of changes uh, were those journalists, young journalists going through when they stopped doing this and then start writing their stories and how like that, I mean, it's a very small sample I know, but like how that computational thinking was structuring their sort of unstructured stories. Um. An anecdotal answer to that, uh, and then a, and then a, a broader answer. Um, and I think we're getting close to the end. Yeah, um, five minutes. So, but I'm happy to talk to everybody when this is all done. Uh, the anecdotal answer is that actually uh, the journalists that took to this, the the, the students who took to this most easily, uh, sample size of three, uh, were not the journalists. 
like I said, there was a SEPA student and there was another student who studied government. And in some ways, uh, thinking, you know, leaving narrative behind was actually initially, they all got it um, to about an equal degree by the end, but this, the quasi-social scientist in training uh, took to this much more, had less they needed to work through, <laughs> you know, in order to get this, um, in order to do this kind of work. Um, very quickly, because I know, you know, we have time for just a few more questions. Um, another way of looking at this is not whether this is an objectivity question, as you said, but it's a narrative question, right? In which case, you know, the real uh, enemy, if you wanted to have an enemy of this form of reporting, is not traditional reporting, but is, you know, Hunter S. Thompson, right? Like, that's the, the you know, the deeply humanistic, subjective, Tom Wolfe's and Hunter S. Thompson's of the world, they're, the, they're, the, the, they're the, the other side, right? Which is this, you know, argument that, you know, narrative is everything, right? And facts uh, are something else, right? Um, a lot more I could say on that, yes. But that's a great point. Uh, just a quick question. Um, yeah, it's encouraging that there's a jobs out there for content analyzers, because this is really an interesting mashup of journalism and content analysis, as Sarah mentioned. Um, but what it makes me think is, like, content analysis, if you do that, it's a very messy process. And, and you're trying to, like, put things into categories, and they often don't really fit. And there's these judgment calls being made all over the place. In some ways, this really streamlines that. Um, and it makes it very clean. And it, it, content analysis of this type of copy could be very, very, very easy. Like, I mean, it, in, I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking the moral panic view of this, which, yeah. is, um, which brings up the question of, if content out of this becomes so clean, it's so easy to be analyzed by content uh, analyzers, is it also homogenized? So does this bring up concerns about homogenization of the news? And I'm wondering if, just a quick, another question, um, is there only one type of structure? They're using FrameNet. Right. Are there alternate or proprietary structures that could then become a business model? And would radical journalism be something like a really different framework that would not be looking at hosts or you know, subject, verb, object necessarily, but maybe political economy of the people speaking? Or, you, know, you, could, you could come up with a lot of different alternate structures, I think. Yeah. And just get your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, uh, great, great questions. Um, with regards to the, the homogenization, homogenization of content, you know, I think that ties back into Birchu's question, right, of narrative, right? Like, and also the question I, I answered earlier about like anxiety off ramps, right? Like, you know, the journalists are still writing the stories, but does their training in this process change the way that they then build the narrative, right? And, and you know, that would be a great, I would love to collaborate with anyone uh, who wanted to do that project? I think that would be a lot of fun, and I think that would be, you know, um, that would be a different type of of study for sure, but a, a great one. Um, your second question was alternate structures. Um, yes. So notice, I only mentioned the verb database here. Uh, there are also noun. There are also noun databases. And uh, the interesting thing about the noun databases, what there was, and I'm gonna get this wrong, which is one of the reasons why I didn't mention it, but there was some company, organization, bureaucratic, political infighting that was going on between Google Knowledge Graph and Wiki, uh, Wiki data. Yeah, and this was all in the midst of a big where one was being bought by the other, or one was being shut down, or one was being absorbed into the other one, and I'm sure there are folks out there who know this better than me, but there was actually a change in the management of those database structures occurring just as this was going on. And, and David would say, you know, well, we're using this noun structure now, but we're gonna be using this other one soon. Uh, and the reason was that there was actually a, an organizational changeover in you know, the way those databases were run and managed. Um, yeah, so, you know, again, going back to feminist STS studies, you know, the database you choose is like 90% of the battle, right? <laughs>